Good evening, friends. I'm going to try to tease your mind into active thought tonight, so no chance you're going to sleep. We live in a Jesus-haunted culture that is biblically illiterate. Jesus is a household word. Shoot, it's even a swear word in the Western culture. But people do not know the Bible, and even more disturbingly, the church doesn't know the Bible very well. I, I have administered entrance exams at Asbury for people who want a place out of New Testament 1. <laughs> and there's a page of define this, define that on this exam. And on the top of one of the pages, it has define apostle and you know, this particular person was within the ballpark on that one. And then the next one was to find epistle, and he wrote down the wife of an apostle. <laughs> we live in a Jesus-haunted culture that's biblically illiterate. And I think one of the big problems in dealing with male-female issues is we also live in a soundbite culture. We preach sound bites, we tweet and text sound bites, we memorize sound bites, and we honestly don't have the big perspective of how all these texts really fit together. So what I want to do tonight is a biblical theological thing. I want to do the proper framework for framing this issue and in terms of how the texts fit into this issue. You see, the source of the problem is a problem of sources, and we don't know our sources. We don't know our theology of creation and fallenness and redemption. We just like, we're like children who want the dessert first, and we'd like to eat the cake that's called redemption, and let's not talk about creation and fall. And sometimes the only way to deal with the problem is to deal with the source of the problem. And in this case, the role of women in the church involves a major source problem, a profound misreading of what the Bible actually says about creation and the nature of men and women. You see, words buzzwords like complementarian and egalitarian are frankly inadequate and inaccurate when it comes to getting at the nuances of what, for example, the Genesis story actually says and what the later uses of that story by Jesus and Paul and others actually mean. Well, how so? Well, the term complementarian emphasizes the differences between man and woman, whereas the term egalitarian emphasizes not merely their equality, but all too often their sameness. What then do you do with a situation where both difference and sameness are involved because human beings and their interrelatedness is a complex matter? It cannot be boiled down to sound bites. In regard to sameness, sometimes the assumption is all too often that the only basis of equality must be sameness of some sort in regard to all human roles. The Bible doesn't say so. And I don't agree with that kind of assumption. The basis of equality is that we are all equally created in the image of God and our people of sacred worth. This is the basis of equality. The manifestation of how that works out while we are also busy being male and female is a complex matter. We have all been equally endowed with some tasks in common, such as filling the earth, subduing it, being fruitful and multiply, or doing ministry for Jesus Christ. There are many roles that we can all play. But here's the rub. As much as I might have liked to take one for the team and have been pregnant with my second child, <laughs> alas, I didn't have the right equipment to do it. 
I was not equally able to perform this task, and I could never become the mother of the living, if you know where that phrase comes from. In an age where it is even assumed that gender identity determines nothing, and one can therefore choose one's gender orientation or even have a surgery so you can change your gender identity, it is no surprise that we are confused about these issues. Ontological equality is one thing. Sameness in the sense of women and men being equally able to perform any and all roles in life is another. And the failure to realize this causes nothing but mischief and misunderstanding. It is this unvariegated approach to the matter in the Bible that has led to assumptions such as a woman's role in the physical family should limit or even dictate what roles women can play in the church. This kind of reasoning, however, doesn't work because the physical family and its physical roles are one thing, and roles in the family of faith are another. These different roles are differently determined. The former is to some extent guided by gender, in some cases even limited by gender. The latter is determined by who is gifted and who is graced by God's spirit to do what role in the church. And what gets in the way of women doing the latter is the assumption about the subordination of women to men in general and wives to husbands in particular. But the very basis of the subordinationist argument involves a profound misreading of Genesis 2 and 3. A misreading that does not recognize that the subordination of women to men is a result of the fall. It is not the original blessing, it is the original curse, which reads, your desire will be for your husband and he will lord it over you. That's patriarchy. To love and to cherish becomes to desire and to dominate. This was not God's original plan or his original blessing. It was the original curse. It is not an accident that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, do not show up until after Genesis 3. The conditions for patriarchy were not created by creation itself. They were created by the fall. And herein lies another problem. In the 21st century, many Christians, even some evangelical ones, no longer believe in the historical fall of humanity. They have a doctrine of creation without a doctrine of fallenness. And so they assume that whatever is, is the way God made us, and it is good. This is the very basis of arguments about homosexuality being something God gifted people with. Again, a profound misunderstanding about source arguments is involved. That being the case, we need to revisit the story of creation and fall once more, and if there is time, the use of these stories in the New Testament. From the start, we note that the narrative in Genesis 1, 2, or 3 appears to be presented as a historical account by the author. Hence, a saga or a legend from hoary antiquity, but not a creation myth. Eden is seen as a real place, a place between the Tigris and Euphrates. Last summer, I spent time dipping my toes in the Euphrates. I can promise you it's a real river. Eden is located in the east. And I think we know pretty well where it comes from. It comes from the Fertile Crescent, the top of the Fertile Crescent. According to the story, Eden is thought of as a garden. A gan in Hebrew can mean a park or an orchard with trees. In any case, the implication is it's a royal person's park. God is giving human beings the royal treatment. God forms Adam 
from the ground, I liked Joy's phrase, donating dignity to dirt. <laughs> and God gives that person the kiss of life, breathing into his nostrils. And as the text says, humanity is living dust, a true miracle. There is no body-soul dualism here, but rather body-life dualism. Humanity is not distinguished from animals in being a living being, a nefesh haya. Animals are also nefesh haya. But by being creatures who can relate to God freely and freely choose to respond to his will and his word, we are set apart. We have a unique capacity for relationship with God that the other creatures do not. The capacity of special relationship and the power of moral choice set us apart as the story makes clear in what follows. Two trees were planted in the middle of the garden, one which could lead to everlasting life and the other which was to lead to some kind of death, whether spiritual or physical or both, is not made immediately clear. It seems to be implied that Adam, which really is from Adama, it means the earth creature, the earth creature, <laughs> right? What seems to be implied is that he is not immortal by nature. Otherwise, why have a tree of life in the Garden of Eden? But even though that is true, it may be that he is nonetheless vulnerable to being killed, not inherently immortal, but vulnerable to being killed. In any case, what we know for sure is when they ate of the fruit of the tree, they were subject to death of some sort. The wages of sin, says Paul, is death. Notice the verb yada here, to know. This doesn't regularly imply intellectual knowledge. If you eat of this fruit, you will know. It implies the experience of something. If you eat of this fruit, you will experience the gamut of good and evil and be like Elohim, either God's plural or the God. Here's some irony. The basis of Mormon theology that we shall be as gods is based on the lie of the serpent to Eve. Clearly, God has already defined what is wrong for humankind. Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the experience of good and evil. Not knowledge itself, but presuming to be the captain of one's own fate and the master of one's own ship is what is evil in God's eyes. God had defined one thing that was wrong, eating of this tree which leads to death. The experience of all evil, or even the knowledge of it, leads only to death. Notice that God did not make evil. Evil is not a tangible thing. God, of course, knows all that is good and evil, yet God is neither tempted nor tainted thereby, nor did he make anything that was evil. Indeed, the Hebrew says it was ma'od tov. Tov ma'od, very good, from the beginning. In other words, God has provided everything humankind needs, a supportive environment, readily available food, a meaningful job of tilling the soil and tending the garden, and a relationship with God. All Adam lacks is one thing, a mate. Probably the naming of the animal story indicates that humankind is given power and authority over them for in Hebrew culture, to name something is to define it, to order it, to organize it, and not merely to label it. But it is possible that through this process of examining the animal world, it is also true that Adam was looking for a mate. 
It indicates how close Adam was to the animals, and yet how different, for he found no mate amongst them. Though animals are living beings, they are not to be one with humankind. Only woman who is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. No animal bears the intimacy and kinship with humanity that man and woman can share. We must also go on to add that there is nothing in this story about an androgynous Adam. Woman is not taken out of man, rather she is built up out of a part of him. Adam was looking for his female companion, and she's not simply his other half or even his better half. If man is ish in Hebrew, woman is isha, the one who comes out of the man. However, as we shall see, calling the woman Isha is not giving her a personal name like later in 320 with Eve after the fall when man tries to take control of her. Here is not a naming ritual in the beginning and so an asserting of authority over the woman but a cry of joy. At last I have found someone who is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now that's what I'm talking about. The key phrase is important here, for it was not good for Adam to be alone. Something, by the way, not said of the woman. Adam was made for relationship with God, but also with fellow humans. He is made to be a social, not a solitary creature. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the man. Any man's death diminishes me because I am part of mankind. Do not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for me. Indeed, because he is a social creature, he can only survive if there are other human beings. The phrase goes on, I will make a helper or companion suitable for or corresponding to him. And here, please, no translations with the word helpmate. The old King James had help meet, not helpmate. And it does not mean a helpmate. It means a helper who is meet, that is, suitable for the task. Woman is not man's maid, nor merely his assistant, but a suitable companion corresponding to him. She is the crown of creation, God's last act after which he said, I can't improve on that. It's all very good. Woman is just like man in that she shares the same nature, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and the same capacity for relationship with God, for God made the image male and female. But she is also different, a complement that completes human creation, not a duplicate that is redundant. The Hebrew phrase kenego implies both similarity and supplementariness. Woman is the mirror in which man recognizes himself for who he truly is, a special creature made for special relating. Again, let me stress that the Hebrew word helper or companion here is not implying any subordination. It is regularly used of Yahweh in the Old Testament as the helper of Israel. Certainly no subordination implied inherently in the term. As Bill Arnold notes in his commentary, Adams at last suggests he's been looking amongst the animals for a mate and not finding one until Eve appears on the scene. Various commentators here see the celebration of the first marriage. God brings the woman to the man. Verse 24 suggests this and indicates that marriage should lead to the one flesh union, not be preceded by it. Intercourse is seen as the joyous climax of marital sharing, not a result of the fall. Thank you, monasticism and certainly not the content of the knowledge of good and evil. This was something to be shared without shame. 
Adam and Eve were able to engage in this total sharing without shame, without self-consciousness, without loss of identity until unlike fallen creatures. Fallen creatures say, yes, after the two become one, the question becomes, which one? All seems well until we turn the page and learn of human infidelity in chapter 3. Let me be clear about Genesis 3. It does not solve the problem of theodicy. It does not tell us where evil originally comes from. The story is not about the origin of evil, but about the original sin and its nature and its consequences. We are not told in this story that the snake is Satan. That notion first occurs in later Jewish literature. Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, 4th Maccabees, maybe in Revelation. The connection is a conclusion one draws in light of later and developing revelation. The snake is called arum, crafty or shrewd, which is a play on words on the description of humans as naked, arumim. They are arumim, but the snake is arum. Very interesting. Bill Arnold put it this way, the nudes have been duped by the shrewd, and in their desire to be shrewd, they discovered the naked facts about themselves and became prudes, hence the need for clothing. <laughs> now the first question the snake asks the woman, appearing to seek information, is not seeking information, but trying to plant a seed of doubt. Did God really say you cannot eat of any tree of the garden? Well, of course, the answer to this question is no, with one exception. The woman's first reply is a case of stretching the truth or exaggerating it. She adds to the divine prohibition, nor must we touch it or we will die. Now, problems are brewing here. First of all, we're not told the fruit is an apple, but if you want to know where that idea comes from, here's where it comes from. The Latin word for apple is malum, okay? Which not incidentally is also the word for bad or evil, malus malum. So the translators assumed bad fruit malum Hence, apple. That's not what the Hebrew says. The serpent pretends to know better than the woman and even better than God. Now, this is typical arrogance of the powers of darkness. The serpent insinuates that God is jealously guarding his position as deity. I've heard some theologies like that. May I just say as a footnote, God is not a glory grabber. He's a glory giver. He glorifies his son, and we are his glorious creation in his image. He's not about grabbing up all the glory. He's about sharing it. Sorry, John Piper, you're just wrong. <laughs> The snake is suggesting there is no metaphysical difference between God and humanity. It's just that God knows more. The text may be translated as follows. If you eat of this, you will be like God's Elohim. The woman must choose whether to base her decisions about what is best and true on her own judgment or on God's revealed will. And isn't that always the dilemma with sin? Am I going on my own insight, or shall I follow God's word? This is still humanity's dilemma. It's clear that the woman is free to choose to resist the temptation and obey God. But her eyes are open to the possibilities of sin, and she takes the fruit. It offers physical satisfaction of food, it has aesthetic appeal, it's pleasing to the eye, but the best part is it's desirable for wisdom and what she really wants is wisdom. 
Maybe this is alluded to in 1 John 2.16, which says, Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, come not from the Father, but from the world. More pertinent is the reference to Eve, both here and in the New Testament, especially in 2 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. And this is a very important point. The New Testament writers, including Paul, insist Eve was deceived. But you need to know the meaning of that word. Deception is what happens to someone who has not been properly instructed or knowledgeable in the first place. And a close reading of Genesis shows that it was Adam alone who was given the single commandment, and apparently also the responsibility to correctly inform Eve. This perhaps explains why later commentators, such as Paul in Romans 5, 12 through 21, and Romans 7, put the blame for the fall on Adam rather than on Eve. This is not merely patriarchal thinking. It comes from a close reading of Genesis. Who was responsible for telling Eve what the commandment was and his exact implications? That would be Adam. And since the story implies he's standing right there and she hands him the fruit, why is it that he didn't say, stop in the name of love before you break my heart? Eve was deceived. Adam sinned knowingly. And that's why Adam is blamed for the fall. It is interesting that how that's turned around in 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, where again we hear about Eve being deceived, but then God reverses the curse through the childbearing, i.e. through Mary. Our redemption came into the world through a woman who said, Be it unto me as you have said, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. The story of creation and fall is what helps us make sense of these later uses of the story in the New Testament. Island, Adam is the silent partner to Eve's sin. First, he commits a sin of omission. If he was with her, why didn't he stop it? Secondly, he commits a sin of commission, for he eats too. And yes, their eyes were indeed opened, but what they saw was not their divinity, but the bare facts about their humanity. <laughs> the fig leaves are a pathetic attempt to hide their most obvious and vulnerable parts, the parts that indicate their true maleness and femaleness in the image of God. The issue here is not mere nudity, but rather shameful nakedness, a combination of desire, self-knowledge, and disobedience. You see, our attempts to cover up our nakedness, never mind our sins, are always inadequate and pathetic. I mean, who do we think we're fooling? If God knows all, how exactly can you hide from that? Next, we are told that the couple heard the sound of God coming after them in the garden. And it does not say they heard the sound of his voice. In case you're wondering, that isn't what the Hebrew says. It says they heard the sound of him coming. The hound of heaven was coming. And he doesn't take a confrontational approach. He simply asks, where are you? And he's not asking for information, is he? Think about that in relationship to prayer for a minute. Why do we pray? We are certainly not informing God of anything. Well, God, I wanted to tell you, since you don't really know and the angels aren't on full-time duty, that. No, why do we pray? We pray in order to have intimacy with Abba. We pray in order to hear him speak to us. We are not informing him about things he is unaware of. Where are you? The creatures God has made person personally and specially and given special treatment to are now running from their maker and we've been running ever since. 
It is only sinful humankind who has something to fear from God. Shame is the proper response to sin. But sin doesn't just lead to shame, it also leads to rationalizing. One thing that is true about all of us as fallen human beings is we have an infinite capacity for self-justification and for rationalizing. When humanity is confronted with its sin, rebel humans blame God or other humans. And so in this little blame game, the man blames God. This woman whom you gave me, you, you, you the one, you gave me this woman. The woman blames the snake, that snake, him. And so the human art of passing the book has been inaugurated. God judges these three in reverse order, starting with the source of the trouble, the snake, then the first perpetrator of the sin, and finally the accomplice. And Genesis 3.15 suggests that world history will be an ongoing enmity and battle between humanity and the powers that go bump in the night. Notice, however, that even in judgment there is mercy from God, because we are told that the seed of the woman will crush the head of evil and its source. Now this is poetic language, and it conjures up the image of evil snapping at our heels. That's actually what the Hebrew suggests. He says to the snake, you will snap tensupanu at his heel, and he will crush yusupika, your head. Advantage humans. <laughs> in early Judaism, they saw Genesis 3.15 as an indication of messianic hope for Israel, a victory over Satan by God's people. But the later church fathers took the collective noun Zerah to refer to one particular seed of Abraham, namely Jesus. In any case, it should be clear that the curse on Eve is descriptive of the effects of sin, not prescriptive of how God intends male-female relationships to be. Let me say that again. It should be clear that the curse on Eve is descriptive of the effects of sin, not prescriptive of how God intends male-female relationships to be. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will lord it over you. Now, let's turn the page to the New Testament with the rest of our time. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about what Jesus says about marriage. And we'll focus on Mark 10, if we can. And here's the key hermeneutical clue. Jesus says that God gave ever so many of those commandments in the Mosaic Covenant, including the ones about divorce, because of sclerocardia, the spiritual hardening of the arteries, or as we call it, hard-heartedness. Now, this is a big hermeneutical clue. So much of the commandments given to fallen God's people were meant to limit sin, not license it. So an eye for an eye meant only an eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth meant only a tooth for a tooth. Only a life for a life. It was never meant to license violence. Otherwise, thou shalt not kill doesn't make any sense as one of the big ten. You know, the ones that God gave to Moses and said, take two tablets and call me in the morning. <laughs> Those ten. Here is the principle. You cannot discover God's full and perfect will for humankind by reading through the commandments in the Mosaic Covenant. Because what's going on there is damage control. Overwhelmingly damage control. Yes, there are some commandments that Jesus gladly reaffirms, like thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor's self. 
Absolutely. But if you look at a large bulk of the commandments that are not reaffirmed by Jesus or by Paul in the New Testament, it's because they were given due to hardness of heart. But now that the kingdom has broken in, new occasions teach new duties. He's calling us not to a lower standard of ethics, but a, to a higher spirit-empowered one. Can I get an amen? amen? Why should we think that God would require less of us under grace than he required under law? Come on, people! Give me a break. Have you read the Sermon on the Mount lately? I got news for you. That one gave Moses apoplexy. <laughs> really? Love your enemies? Saw a good bumper sticker the other day. Love your enemies. It will confuse them. <laughs> there is a hermeneutical principle here. If you want to understand the full and complete revelation of the character of God and the will of God, look at Jesus. Look at what Jesus says. Look at the New Testament. For in him is revealed grace and truth. The law that gave us, that Moses gave us, is one thing. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, that means that when we look at what Jesus says, we need to take it as serious as a heart attack. This is not some utopian fantasy. The Sermon on the Mount is not to dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe. No, it's not that. It's not some utopian dream. These are our marching orders. This is what God wants us to live by, by the grace of God, in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the things I have to say that has always puzzled me about my Reformed friends is they're always talking about the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God, and then when I ask them, oh, okay, does that mean God could entirely sanctify us, maybe even in this life since he's so sovereign? Oh, no, that can't happen. I find that very strange. Is God's grace sovereign or no? Inquiring minds want to know. Let me give you three conclusions that I draw from what's going on here. Number one, first conclusion from Mark 10. God permitted divorce. He did not command it. Divorce is a result of sin. That's why in Malachi, we are told that God hates divorce. Second, more important conclusion, Jesus says that the essence of marriage is when God has joined two people together. Let that which God has joined together not be put asunder. People are all the time coupling each, with each other. Young people come to me and say, we want to get married, we're in love. But actually, they're just in heat. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, dear friends, that not all couplings are of God. Indeed, not all marriages are of God. It's perfectly possible for you to have a paper from the state a marriage ceremony in a church, a ring on your finger, and a clergy in attendance. And God didn't want those two people to be joined together. You've been talking about abuse. I'll give you a good one. I'm pastoring four churches at once in rural North Carolina. And there's a 17-year-old girl in one of my congregations, Maple Springs United Methodist Church. And she's enamored with a 29-year-old man who, as it turned out, had been previously married. Already little red flags are going up. Now, the appearance of the girl were not very strong. And the girl was very strong-willed. And this relationship was hot and heavy. And they wanted to get married. And when I found out that this man was a wife beater of his previous wife, I said, not now and not ever. 
no way, Jose. So they found another willing clergy person to do the wedding. But so much trepidation did the parents of this girl have that they asked me, get this, to go to the church, not my church, on the wedding day, go to the vestibule and try to convince them that they don't have to do this. Now I get to the church, there's a pickup truck with a gun rack. <laughs> I'm thinking I could have a very short ministry. I go in there and try to convince them, and I don't convince them. The girl is adamant, the guy is shooting daggers at me, and they had a marriage ceremony. Now, I suspected there really was a bun in the oven, and I was right. Seven months later, a child is born. And three months after the child is born, he is beating the 17-year-old girl within an inch of her life because she's not as pretty as she was before. Now, I want you to fast forward 20 years later. I'm talking to a United Methodist minister who is now the counselor of this woman. And what she said over and over again to my friend was, I wish I had listened to Dr. Ben in the first place. They were joined by clergy in a church with rings, with the music, with the wedding dress, with a paper from the state, and there's no way on God's green earth that God joined them together. Are you hearing me? That's not the indication of what a marriage is. In the first century, there was no clergy marriage. In the first century, the Roman Empire was not sending out marriage certificates. In the first century, it is not the case that there was first there's romance, and then there's kissing, and then there's hand-holding, and then... No, most of the marriages in the first century were arranged marriages. And the girls in early Judaism were 12 or 13. As soon as they became pubescent, the two fathers got together to negotiate the bride price. Are you getting the picture here? So when Jesus says, let those whom God has joined together never, ever, ever be put asunder, no divorce, I think he was serious as a heart attack about that. But he was also equally serious that there is another calling in life to be single for the sake of the Lord. And here is where the church has really, really failed. He says, if you can't handle one wife, one life to the dirty dozen, he says, there is this other alternative. You can be a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. You can be single for the sake of the kingdom. In other words, to be married in the Lord is not natural, it's supernatural. It requires grace gifting. To be single for the sake of the Lord requires, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, a charisma, a grace gift gift. Either calling requires grace and the sustenance of the Holy Spirit to live out. If we were serious about stopping divorce in the church and stopping broken relationships, we would have done a far better job on, of affirming people to be single for the sake of the Lord and promote this as a legitimate calling in Christ. We should not be like one church that I serve, which will remain nameless, that had a Sunday school entitled Pairs and Spares. <laughs> as if somebody should be thinking of themselves as a spare tire until they're hitched to another tire. This is horrendous theology. And the reason we don't have an adequate theology of marriedness is because we don't have an adequate theology of singleness, which Paul said at the end of the day is preferable. I want to read you a quote from Elizabeth Schusser Fiorenza. She says this, divorce, quote, is necessary because of the male hardness of heart, for it is in this setting only men could divorce. That is because of men's patriarchal mindset and reality. However, Jesus insists, God did not intend patriarchy, but created persons as male and female human beings. It is not woman who is given into the power of man in order to continue 
his house and his family line. No, Genesis says that the man shall sever connections with his own patriarchal family and the two shall become one. He must leave and then cleave to his wife. That's not patriarchy. That's something different altogether. Paul is just as insistent that marriage involves no divorce. The one flesh union should be seen as permanent as long as both parties live. And he says if you can't live with that, in 1 Corinthians 7, he says there is a second calling, a charisma, to be as I am and remain single for the sake of the kingdom. You see, Jesus did something radical. For in early Judaism, A, there were no female disciples until Jesus, and B, there was no legitimation of being single for the sake of the kingdom. Do you know who that most benefited? Oh, women who followed Jesus. For they were not required anymore to simply fulfill domestic duties as wives and mothers. When the men didn't like the no divorce thing because he took away their privilege of divorce, the men said, if that's the way it is between a man and a woman, better not to marry. Jesus says, well, yeah, y'all could be like me, eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. You see, we do have two options. And what that means is that the creation order mandate to be fruitful and multiply is no longer obligatory on all of us. As it turned out, Jesus did not believe in justification by grace through baby making. <laughs> and that is not what 1 Timothy 2, 15 means. For the woman shall be saved through the childbearing, not through making babies. The childbearing is Mary and Jesus. I want to talk about one other aspect of this. One of the few places that Genesis 1, and 26 get alluded to or directly quoted, other than in Jesus' teaching on marriage, is in Galatians 3, 28, which reads, get out your Greek New Testament, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, and then it says, no male and female in Christ. This is a direct quotation of the Genesis story. What is Paul saying? He's saying it is not necessary for women to be joined to men in order to be in Christ. It is not necessary for men to be joined to women to fulfill God's will for their life. He's advocating the very thing Jesus advocates when he talks about being single for the sake of the kingdom. What really matters as the kingdom comes and the form of this world passes away is not the earthly institutions. In that same passage in 1 Corinthians 7 I referred to earlier, he says the schema, the very form of this world and its institutions are passing away, and thank God they are. The sooner that the political institutions pass away, the better off we'll be. Imagine a new creation where there are no pol politicians, no sick people, no hospitals, no lawyers, no need for doctors. I could go on. What Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 is that the form of this world, which includes marriage, because marriage is an earthly institution for our earthly good. It's not an eternal institution. He says, now that the kingdom is coming, we should live as if not. Want a radical teaching? This is radical teaching, right? You should spend money as if not. You should live in marriage as if not. You should do business as if not. And what is he saying? He's not saying don't get married. 
He's not saying don't do business, but he's saying that those things have been relativized because a greater good is coming. The good of the kingdom of God, the good of the family of faith, which is the forever family of God. That's what's coming, and it relativizes all of the normal earthly things, including marriage. This is the other reason why it's okay to advocate being single for the sake of the kingdom. Of course, you can take that too far, too. Augustine said, if we would all remain celibate, Jesus would have to come back sooner. <laughs> but he forgot about converting people through preaching. So one more step, and then we'll draw to a close. When we look at these passages, we sometimes forget that Jesus and Paul are pastors dealing with people where they are. I hope you do that too. You cannot start where you want them to be. You have to start where they are, even if it's down in the dirt. So when Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11 is authorizing women to pray and prophesy and to put on a head covering, what he's doing is starting with a patriarchal situation that already exists and trying to put the yeast of the gospel into an existing fallen situation. This is also what he's doing with the household codes. He's not baptizing patriarchy and calling it good. He is injecting the yeast of the gospel into the household situation in order to change it. And you can see the trajectory of the change when you get to Ephesians 5.21 where he says, we should all be submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Praise the Lord. That's where the discussion is going. It's not enough to ask where does he start. You have to ask where is the discussion going. So what's going on in 1 Corinthians 11? It's an argument about sources. Kephale means source, like the head of a river. And so he is going to argue that God the Father is the source of Christ, and Christ being the wisdom of God who was there at creation and involved in all of creation, read Colossians 1, is the source of the man, and the man is the source of the woman. It's an argument about source, not about male headship over women. And in any case, in verse 11, he says, nevertheless, ever since that first take woman out of man thing, men have been coming out of women regularly, and that didn't mean that all men should be subordinate to women. <laughs> you see, Paul is an equal opportunity critiquer of all bad theologies about headship. And what he really wants to do is empower both men and women to serve God through prayer and prophecy and preaching and teaching and discipleship. And the proof of that is everywhere else in Paul's letters. Whether we're talking about a Phoebe or a Priscilla or uh, a uh, Junia or any number of other women that Paul affirms in their teaching or preaching capacities. The story of our faith is a story about sources and origins. And if we really want to understand where this is all going, we have to get back to the garden because we are stardust, we are golden, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Thank you very much. <laughs>